Policy in the Office of Public Policy to begin the presentation. Danielle. Great. Thanks, Ryan, and welcome everyone. Um, welcome to our Advocacy Town Hall. Like Ryan said, my name is Danielle Bubnis, and it really is my privilege to lead the advocacy team here in the LLS Office of Public Policy. Um, we so appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Today, we're joined by both LLS staff and volunteers, including folks from our volunteer advocacy community across the country. For some of you today, this might be your first time meeting LLS, or for other ones of you, um, maybe you've been long time involved with LLS, but this is your first time meeting um, the LLS Office of Public Policy. And for others of you, we know each other well. Um, but whatever your path is to get to us today here on the town hall, we're delighted to have you with us today. So thank you. And again, the first thing, first and foremost, I want to I want to again say thank you for taking time out of your day to be here with us. Um, we know that um, your time is precious. We know that there's a lot going on, and we're going to do everything um, that we can to maximize this next sixty minutes together, um, and really make this worth your while. Um, the thing that brings us together. Um, the thing that here at LLS we believe, and I know everyone on the line believes, is that all, ca all cancer patients deserve access to quality and affordable care. But today, unfortunately, re the reality is they don't always get it. And that's why our team here in the LLS Office of Public Policy, we're committed to the work that we do. We're committed to driving forward policies that ensure that access to care, that ensure um, that those barriers are broken down and ensure that patients are able to get the treatment, they, the treatment that they need at the very moment they need it. But honestly, the truth is that we can't do this um, work by ourselves. We can't do it alone. We rely on individuals like you, individuals, um, cancer survivors, healthcare professionals, family members, friends, LLS staff. Um, it's your voices that are helping us um, create the change that patients need, that patients are counting on. Um, and we're so glad that you're in this fight with us. So I'm gonna turn it over to our team here in the Office of Public Policy, Mary Elena, our Vice President. Um, of the, of the office, um, Brian Connell, our executive director of federal government affairs, and Lucy Culp, our um, executive director of state government affairs. They're gonna share with you some of the barriers that patients are facing and the policy solutions that both LLS and advocates across the country are pushing lawmakers to move on over the next several months. We'll also hear from Three of our really terrific volunteer advocates. Um, we'll hear from Jill in Connecticut, Laurie out in California, and Michael in Pennsylvania, who are going to share their experience and their perspective um, through video um, as to why access to care is so important to them. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mary Elena to get us started. Thanks, Danielle. And uh, hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I am Mary Elena. I lead the Office of Public Policy here at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And I am delighted to have the opportunity to spend this next hour with you and with our team. Now, we have three important time-sensitive policy issues that we're all gathered here together to talk about during today's town hall. But to be clear, those three issues aren't the only ones that are important to blood cancer. Year round, the team here in the Office of Public Policy, along with lots and lots of volunteers all across the country, are working together to move the needle on, uh, frankly, a, a broad range of policy issues that are really critical to blood cancer. The ones of those issues that you see here on the screen are our priorities for 2022, the areas where the Office of Public Policy is most focused. I'd like to um, take the next couple of minutes to uh, take you on a tour of this broader set of LLS priorities to establish some context around the three issues that we will talk about in more detail. 
I also offer you this little tour to ensure that you're aware of the other topics that we look forward to talking about with you on other occasions over the course of 2022. So first up, with regard to health insurance coverage, we are hugely concerned with the quality and affordability of health insurance coverage. And that's because health insurance has an enormous influence on a patient's ability to access treatment, to access a clinical trial, or to access a medical specialist, right? It, it affects their quality of life. It affects whether it'll be feasible for a patient to stick to their treatment plan. It affects financial well-being, emotional well-being. Truly, it's hard to overstate the importance of patients having access to good health insurance, which is why, in a nutshell, quality and affordability of coverage uh, are topics that are among our top priorities here. Second, let's take a moment to talk about Medicaid. Medicaid is our nation's health insurance program for adults and families who are living with a low income. It covers more than 82 million people, ensuring that those 82 million people have the means of accessing medical care. Now, this is a, an incredibly diverse group of people. It, it includes more than 2 million cancer survivors who every year count on Medicaid for access to care. And more than a third of kids who are diagnosed with cancer in our country rely on Medicaid for access to the treatment that they need. So in brief, it's a top priority here at LS to ensure that patients have access to Medicaid and that Medicaid coverage remains robust. Next, let's look at junk health insurance. Now here I'm referring to the many different kinds of health insurance products that might be called health insurance, but which in reality don't resemble the comprehensive coverage that's so critical to a patient being able to access their care. Because these plans cover so little, they often leave patients holding the bag when it comes to their medical expenses, or in some cases they leave patients having to just forego care altogether. That's why we are committed to ensuring that policymakers take seriously the responsibility of regulating these types of plans, of holding them to standards, holding them accountable for patient protections. And by the way, an overwhelming majority of Americans across political party agree with this notion that policymakers ought to pay attention to these plans and to hold them to high standards. Let's turn next to another policy priority of ours, and that is ensuring that cost sharing for medications is not so high as to prevent patients from being able to afford their prescriptions when they go to the pharmacy. Now, here we're working to make that a reality for patients with all different kinds of health insurance, including Medicare Part D. On that front, we're, we're hopeful we'll see major progress this year, and that is really all about uh, a tragedy, frankly, uh, the tragedy that there is currently no upper limit to how much a patient enrolled in Medicare Part D has to pay for their prescription drugs. And so for some blood cancer patients, that means having to pay more than $13,000 a year for just one of the medications that they rely on to treat their cancer. And that's to say nothing of the many other, many other important aspects of uh, healthcare that they need access to in addition. So Safe to say this is a major focus for us as it has been for many years now. Next up, pediatrics. Um, you heard me mention kids with cancer just a few moments ago. Well, 40% of pediatric cancers are blood cancers, right? Lots of you know that, but far too many of the kids being treated for cancer are being treated with therapies that were developed decades ago. And many of those therapies leave them with chronic health conditions that persist for decades following treatment. And that's to say nothing of the other barriers that kids and their families routinely encounter in the course of uh, seeking uh, care. So that's why our policy priorities here include a focus on ensuring that cancer research pursues the cures that kids deserve, that families can navigate the complex maze that is cancer care, and that survivors of a pediatric cancer don't encounter discrimination in the health insurance market as a result of having a pre-existing condition, right? Their cancer diagnosis that they received during childhood. Next, I want to call your attention to health equity 
Uh, we are renewing our focus on health equity to ensure that OPP is advancing the policies that are critical to combating health disparities. We feel strongly that a real commitment here means approaching all of our policy priorities with health equity in mind, whether that's coverage affordability or access to drugs or pediatrics, right? And it also, right, a commitment here also requires our team to take steps to ensure that the LLS volunteer advocacy community is a space where diverse advocates are represented and included. And last but not least, legal advocacy. This is a special focus for us right now at if the term is unfamiliar with you, all it means is this, educating judges about the ways in which their decisions in court cases that are important to the LLS mission, right? We're educating them about the ways in which their decisions might impact blood cancer patients. Now, this is, this is more and more critical because more and more healthcare policy is being challenged in the courts with judges being put in the position of having to make decisions about the future of those laws, about the future of patient protections that many of you have fought for years to secure. So naturally we felt it was incumbent upon LLS to bring our advocacy to the courts just as we bring it to Congress, to state legislators, to regulators and all the other places where healthcare policy is made. So with that, I will, I will end our brief tour here uh, and let's dive in on our first topic for today, pediatrics. Brian, over to you. All right, thanks so much. Uh, and good afternoon, everybody, uh, or morning, depending on where you are. Um, before we do dive into the details on this first uh, kind of issue focus for this discussion, uh, which is you know, funding for pediatric cancer research, uh, let's hear from LLS advocate Jill uh, from Connecticut as she shares her story um, via video. So I'll pause for a moment as we start that video. When Aaron was diagnosed, one of the things that, that hit me was nothing prepares you for this. You never expect to hear it. It is something that comes out of left field and knocks you for a loop. And what your job is, especially when you're the parent, is to stand back up, you know, knock it back. And that's probably what has made me such an advocate for the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. I wanted to do something to get back some of that control that was taken away from us on that day he was diagnosed. children. We want better and we can get better. We can get better if we have that kind of research that, that only a government can, can do. We, we can get better if we speak out and let people know, hey, the treatments that our children are going through are treatments that were developed 35 years ago. If people know, if people understand, then people will join us in our fight. They will help us work to get better treatments for children and survivors of pediatric cancer. Great, thanks. Thanks to Jill um, for taping that for us. And it's never easy to follow Jill, even pre-taped, uh, but I'll do my best. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Again, I'm Brian Connell. Uh, as Danielle mentioned earlier, I lead um, LS's federal government affairs work, uh, the team here at LLS. And um, for the first topic highlighted, uh, today, uh, we will be talking about kind of our work to accelerate the development of new and, and better treatment for the youngest blood cancer patients. Um, as you heard from Mary Elena, she went through some of the items are on our agenda. You know, one of our focus areas year after year continues to be you know, how do we best leverage the power of government to accelerate the development of new and better treatment for the youngest blood cancer patients, um, children, Adolescents, young adults, they face unique challenges in their treatment and in their survivorship journeys. Um, you know, we are always incredibly thankful for the progress that we've achieved to date. Um, you know, nine out of 10 children diagnosed with uh, leukemia survive that diagnosis. But there is so much more that we need to do. Um, on the one hand, to make leukemia treatment easier 
and more tolerable and true for all, all forms of cancer for pediatrics. And on the other hand, to reduce the late effects of treatments, the, the side effects that folks deal with for years. So you know, to put it plainly, we cannot be satisfied with treatments that we have today that cure pediatric cancer, but put patients at higher risk for heart disease and bone problems and other cancers for decades after their treatment ends. Uh, and that's why we are so excited about the moment we are in today. Um, yeah, I'd say we're at an inflection point um, with a small investment of federal dollars, um, just $80 million each year for the past few years and then the future, uh, you know, 80 million out of a federal budget of trillions. The National Cancer Institute is right now building the research infrastructure that will be powering the next generation of cancer research. Uh, funding provided under the Childhood Cancer STAR Act allows the nation's primary pediatric cancer biobank to provide researchers uh, who want to you know, learn more about uh, you know, the, the next breakthrough to get the cancer tissue samples they need to explore new approaches to cancer treatment. Um, at the same time, funding under the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative uh, also happens at the National Institute of Health is giving researchers the opportunity to learn from every single child with cancer, no matter where or how they're treated. So those two projects are building, you know, we say the infrastructure for the next breakthrough. They are giving researchers the biological tissue samples they need and the data they need to accelerate the progress that we're making against childhood cancer today. Um, so the ask we are making to Congress, you know, this year, um, and folks who've been with us for years have, have heard this in the past because we this is a mantra that we have brought to the Hill uh, several times in recent years. And each year we've been successful that we you know, wanna make a clear and simple ask that Congress fully fund these two programs. Um, that's the Childhood Cancer STAR Act. That's the CCDI I mentioned. These are two programs that are critical to fighting childhood cancer. So they need to provide $80 million dedicated to childhood cancer. Uh, and it will make a difference. You know, it really is um, the, the nexus point that's pulling together researchers who are in every single part of the country, um, they need those uh, biobank samples and they need that data. So uh, with that, you know, hopefully it's a helpful kind of first summary of our work in pediatrics. Um, would love to open it up to any questions folks have on, on this piece of our agenda related to pediatric cancer research. Uh, we will have some time, I think at the end of the call for other questions that remain unanswered through the, the Q&A chat, um, but, would love to hear, you know, folks, I know a lot of folks are joining the call who are really passionate about these issues, uh, particularly related to childhood cancer. would love to kind of hear uh, any questions folks may have. Dan Danielle. Thanks, Brian. I, um, I saw actually Danielle, um, a different Danielle, raised her hand in the chat. And I figured while there's some questions still coming in through the Q&A function, um, Danielle, we'd give you an opportunity to, um, to ask your question live. Um, Thank you, I'm Danielle from Colorado, and I'm a long-term childhood cancer survivor of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And um, like you were saying, so many uh, two-thirds of childhood cancer survivors have these uh, long-term effects such as secondary cancers, heart damage, infertility, um, as we transition into adulthood. So I was just wondering um, how will these investments ensure that individuals like me can get the care we not only need to survive, but to thrive as we grow older? That's a really, really great question. And thanks, thanks for asking it. Um, it is not talked about enough about how do we uh, approach the needs of pediatric cancer survivors and cancer survivors in general, but particular pediatric cancer survivors. Uh, it is such an intense journey, and it's, you know, you know, there's a life full of challenges that often uh, follow that. That are, you know, the, the cure is fantastic, but those challenges are real. Um, when we say the Childhood Cancer Star Act, it's a long name that we've shortened via Star, using that as an acronym. But the first, the S in Star, is actually survivorship, and you know, so much of the the goal of that bill has been to look at real. Um, credible NIH-led research around survivorship, around what are the challenges that exist, how do we help patients through those, and how do we incorporate what we know about survivorship into research that will develop the next round of treatments that will be less harmful, that will lead to less side effects into the future. Um, 
but that's not honestly a battle that we can fight with research alone. Um, you know, that is, you know, you heard Marilena walk through so many different pieces of the agenda. All of those pieces are critical to helping survivors of childhood cancer because, you know, we need every piece of it. You can't have unaffordable insurance or junk insurance or any of these things when you know you're going to rely on that insurance into the future to access your survivorship care. So um, it's a really holistic challenge that we're going to kind of approach with every piece of our agenda, but excited that the Childhood Cancer Star Act has a chance to make a difference on the research side uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Danielle. Um, Brian, another one um, that had come in um, was, you know, $80 million seems in the big scheme of things, um, not like a whole lot of money. Is that enough to make an impact? Yeah, it's a really great question. You know, there's a lot of money being spent at uh, the National Cancer Institute. There's a, there are billions more going into cancer care uh, or cancer research every year. A portion of that is related to childhood cancer apart from the STAR Act. I think what is so critical about the STAR Act funding and the, you know, we say CCDI, that, that data initiative funding, what's so critical about that $80 million is it's building the infrastructure for everything else. So that money, that $80 million, being able to very quickly access tissue samples from tumors that you need to study and being able to quickly access you know, medical records from patients who have had that diagnosis from around the country over the last 10 years within a certain age bracket, being able to pull those things quickly means that you can do more with your grant dollars, whether those grant dollars as a researcher are coming from NIH, whether they're coming from LS, you know, whether they're coming from anyone, you can better use those dollars. You can do faster research. You can do better research. You're more likely to actually choose a career as a researcher in childhood cancer if you have this infrastructure at your fingertips. And that's why it's so critical to build that infrastructure now. And it, you know, it seems like a small investment, but it's going to pay dividends and our ability to actually make do more with the research dollars that we're able to put forward, both from the federal government, but also from groups like LLS in the future. Thanks, Brian. Um, another one that came in um, through the chat, I'm trying to keep track of that. Um, can you just talk a little bit about the status of the STAR Act funding? Um, where, where in the process is, where in the process is that particular um, piece of legislation? Yeah, yeah. So there, um, there's a lot happening. Um, I will say. So it's a great question because there's a lot happening. Uh, you know, every year the government has to be funded. Like Congress has to pass legislation to fund the federal government. Um, we are in a strange place where we're actually at the end of one year and the beginning of another, even though we're technically in the middle of a year. So um, Congress is actively wrapping up last year's funding, uh, which you know we expect to have this eighty million dollars included. Uh, but right, they are at the same time, and so very quickly and, um, and less judiciously than even maybe normally, they are pulling together the funding for fiscal year 2023. That fiscal year starts in September, and so there's a few months left for them to pass that bill. That's the bill that we are wanting to make sure we advocate for that $80 million, because we think we're well situated for the one that's for this fiscal year that hopefully will be resolved next month. Um, but we are in that process where they are really putting pen to paper on this next fiscal year to fund the government. And one of those big pieces, you know, these bills are very long. One of those pieces is, is funding for the STAR Act and funding for the data initiative uh, at NCI. We are also, I will say, I'll preview very quickly. We are also looking at the next five years of STAR Act, a reauthorization bill that will happen probably you know, more towards the summer. You'll start hearing about, um, about that from us that makes sure that we're able to continually push the same money, maybe even you know, do more things with it uh, in the coming years. Great, thanks, Brian. Um, and I've got two other questions here. One is um, pediatric specific and one is just a little bit more um, research oriented. So I'll ask the pediatric one first and I don't know if you have an um, answer off the top of your head. And if you don't, we can get back to um, this individual, but do you know how many cancer research centers are working on only pediatrics? It's a good question. I don't think it happens a lot at the full center level. I think it happens a lot at the clinician and researcher level. So there are, you know, dedicated pediatric hematologists, oncologists, who this is what they do. And they need this. They tell us we, we've been working with the children's oncology group, which coordinates, you know, I think like 80% of those professionals around the country. And they need this infrastructure. They, they provide it today. What, what they need is for it to be better. 
and they know that and they rely on these grants from the federal government for this $80 million. And so um, we're trying to coordinate with them to help make that happen. Um, but that's that's kind of how they, um, they're connected to kind of these asks. Perfect. Thanks so much, everyone, for your questions. Um, on this topic area in particular, I, I'm really excited about the passion around um, our pediatric agenda and, and the policies that we're pushing forward. So thank you. Um, and Brian, I'm going to pose this last question to you in just the one minute that we have left here before we need to move on to our next Topic. Um, but this is a little bit more broad about just research across the board um, and what are we doing um, in the Office of Public Policy to prioritize research funding um, and where does it fit in our agenda? Yeah, we are very busy on research funding, especially right now, um, because it is, this is the season where they are putting pen to paper on the bills to fund the government. This is the time where we come forward with both the broad requests across the entire cancer community, like we want the National Cancer Institute to be funded at a certain billions of dollars level. And we wanna be very clear, we just share one number. So with one voice, they're very, we're very clear about what we, what we expect from the federal government. But we're also spending a lot of time on programs like the STAR Act, like CCDI, where we pull out very specific line items of the budget and say, we want this dollar amount for this program. It has to be priority. Without voices like ours in that conversation, those get forgotten because there's a lot of there's a lot of de desire of, for people to get funds, and so a lot of people in the conversation. If you aren't the squeaky wheel, you don't get uh, funding. And so, LLS is out there on all the little asks all the time. We have our staff and our and advocates are making those requests um, all throughout mostly the spring time, and then holding people accountable throughout the year to make that happen. Um, and then there are new bills that are coming forward, like let's establish ARPA, H, folks may have heard about, are new areas of the government that would do cancer research among other medical research uh, projects. So we do those kind of big long-term projects alongside that annual funding process that happens. So it, it's a throughout the year process to make sure the federal government is doing everything it can to um, fund cancer research. All right, great. Thanks so much, Brian. I really appreciate your insight um, on that topic area. And I'm just keeping um, keeping track of our time together. I'm going to move us along to um, clinical trials. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, we can talk about any of these topics all day long, uh, but <laughs> in the interest of time, uh, our, sepic, our second topic today, um, as you can see from the slide, is clinical trials. Um, and to get us started, we'll hear from Lori, who is a, a passionate advocate from California. Her clinical trial story, um, her, her experience on clinical trials actually bought her time to stay alive as more effective treatments were developed and researched. So uh, she'll share why better access to trials is so critical for patients across the country from her story. You know, he was in kindergarten when I was diagnosed. So in 12 years, guess what? He spent his whole elementary, middle, and high school with a mom who was sick and in treatment. I never had a treatment break that led me to have seven different treatments in the total of 12 years that I had the disease. And clinical trials played a very important role during that time period. And three of my seven treatments were clinical trials. And as it turns out, they were the best treatments I had, you know, the most targeted treatments, fewest side effects, and the best long-term outcomes. And what that did, it didn't get rid of my cancer. I had stable disease, but it bought time for other things that were more effective to come out and enable me to stay alive to be able to take advantage of those newer therapies in subsequent years. And I was very fortunate to live in Los Angeles because within a stone's throw of where I live, I had numerous places I could go for trials. You know, in our country, it shouldn't be about luck. We are the wealthiest country in the world. And we have these phenomenal treatments now that are just getting better, but if only a small number of patients have access to it. How is that a democratic system or a just system? I, 
I am so inspired by uh, Lori's story every time I hear it, ever since I heard it live a few years ago when she was able to come to DC. Um, and it is the perfect example of why trials are so important. Um, and access to trials is so important as well. I have to say there are a lot of patients who will receive a diagnosis. Um, they start treatment with the standard of care and they will achieve remission. And that's good. Uh, we want more patients to respond to initial treatment just like that. But there are still so many patients whose journey isn't so simple, uh, as I think is shared by folks you know, who are even on the line today. So for many of those patients, after the standard of care and subsequent therapies, even, you know, you heard from Lori, fourth line treatment, um, after those don't work, uh, the best option, the one that is most likely to give a patient a positive outcome at the end of the day, is often to enroll in a clinical trial. Uh, it may very well give them the best chance of survival, or like in Lori's case, may give you the best chance of just uh, staying healthy enough for the next uh, treatment breakthrough to come out. So, you know, at, at the same time, it was, it's great to you know, make sure that every individual has the best chance of survival. Those results also help advance the science of cancer treatment and helps countless other people. Um, many of us have been the beneficiary of trials that come, come before us. Sadly, and despite the fact that a trial really could be the best treatment for a patient um, and lead to the next breakthrough, it is far too difficult and far too costly to enroll in and stay on a trial today. Um, even worse, there are structural barriers that leave patients behind, particularly from underserved communities. Um, these factors all intersect and leave us with the status quo. Uh, trials are out of reach when they are uh, a patient's best chance. They are slow to produce results. And when the results come, they rely on assumptions uh, from uh, that a care that worked in a certain type of patient actually will work in another type of patient without the data to prove that. So again, we find ourselves, the exciting thing at, at, in the Office of Public Policy, we find ourselves at a really interesting moment. Uh, because when the pandemic hit, it forced everyone to toss aside the traditional playbook and adapt ongoing clinical trials to keep them going. Uh, if folks remember this, it was, it was a challenge across the country to keep these trials going. We've learned a lot from those changes, and we are now rethinking how clinical trials work and how we can best empower patients from underserved communities to choose the best option for them you know, and many times that is a clinical trial. Um, with all that we've learned, we need Congress now to take some bold steps to remove barriers that make it harder for patients to see a trial as an accessible, affordable treatment option. And we need Congress also to give community cancer providers and other community providers the resources that they need to connect patients with the trials that are right for them, uh, especially providers who serve patients of color and patients in rural areas who are often left behind uh, from the clinical trial landscape. The good news is that there is a bipartisan legislation. We don't say bipartisan very much in terms of what happens in DC these days, uh, but there is bipartisan legislation in Congress to do just that. Um, there's a bill that was recently introduced called the DEPICT Act, D-E-P-I-C-T, DEPICT. Um, it's HR 6584 for folks who like to uh, do the research online. Um, and it is actually one, I'll say, you know, it's one of a, a handful of bills that are going to really make exciting progress that we hope to kind of wrap together and pass this year. The DEPICT Act itself would give trusted clinicians in underrepresented communities the resources they need to hire the staff and then put in place the IT systems that they need to connect patients with the best trial for the patient. Um, but importantly, also, it would hold accountable drug makers who sponsor most trials and it would ensure that those drug makers, the sponsors, as they are designing a trial, are making trial access a priority when they are in that design process. That means you know, moving some trial components out of the you know, centralized academic medical center and into the community. Um, you know, the question, do you really need to travel two hours to get your blood drawn in a downtown hospital when you have a Quest or a LabCorp five minutes from your house? Uh, or you're at your doctor's office anyway for another, uh, another you know, regular checkup, um, why not be able to do that blood draw there? So those are the types of reforms that we want, uh, simple, effective changes that break down real barriers for patients. Um, and so that's what we're asking for. So 
um, you'll you'll find out more. You know, uh, we'll follow up with more info on the Depict Act and other priority changes that we want to see in the clinical trial landscape. But we're excited that we're kind of here at the right time for making these change changes happen this year. Uh, so I wanted to share that with you all. So with with that, I will again pause. Maybe Danielle, I don't know if you're, you're coming back, uh, and we can uh, maybe spend the next few minutes answering a couple more questions on um, this part of the agenda around clinical trial access. Great, thanks, Brian. Um, and while we're waiting for some, and we'll do the same thing that we did before, while we're waiting for some questions to come in through the q and um, also trying to keep my eye on the chat button. Um, any questions from our audience that folks might want to um, ask Brian live? Um, I think we have time maybe for one or two. Hi guys. Hi, this is, I'm JJ Duncan. Um, thank you so much for this. It's so informative and just really wonderful to hear the plans in the works. Um, about clinical trials, I have a lot of interest in hearing what's going on here. When my son was in treatment, um, we had to travel out of state. We had to go to Houston, Texas for a clinical trial. And it was really our, our Hail Mary pass to give him a chance of survival. Um, so we picked up our family of four and, and went. Um, it was really challenging though. Um, we, I wasn't working at the time, so I could care for him. So we were relying on Medicaid, as you mentioned earlier, it was absolutely something that we, our family needed to get through his treatments. But we found like when we went to a different state, our Medicaid didn't cover things like nausea meds, just things that were considered outside of the trial. Um, you know, and it was just getting him into the trial was a serious hurdle of red tape. Um, and our doctor thankfully was amazing. She works with LLS a lot, as a matter of fact, and she was amazing and helped push it through to get him into the trial, but there was a great delay with that and it cost us. Um, so I'd like to know what Congress is doing to ensure that patients have access to clinical trials in their community and, you know, coverage issues and all of the things that we faced. Thanks so much, JJ. I mean, that is the your the story that you share just typifies why we need change, uh, and it covers so many different distinct things that Congress is considering right now. Um, one, it, there's actually a bill called Accelerating Kids Access to Care Act, uh, focused on Medicaid providers because it is like I mean, it's it's hard on any insurance, but it's particularly hard on Medicaid when you're crossing state lines to get quick access, and when you're in for pediatric patients in particular, but in general, when you need access to a trial, it's because a treatment has failed and you quickly need to get on that trial. So um, we are working to streamline that process, uh, streamline so that if you're a Medicaid provider in Texas that California knows it's okay. You know, We will pay for that Medicare, Medicaid provider in, in Texas because they are assumed to be okay. We don't have to go through weeks and weeks and weeks of approval process um, just to get you know, one, one patient from California on that trial. Um, so that, that's one piece, but all that you mentioned around the, the associated care that's needed, uh, making sure that's paid for, and then also making sure you have to travel to Texas, maybe a little bit less by migrating more of those services that could be done in California, moving those to California. So it would be the occasional trip instead of something that would be constant, which is, you know, uh, necessary for some trials, but not necessary for other trials. So, um, that is a really core component of what the DEPICT Act is doing. Um, and while we are pushing on Capitol Hill, we are also banging on all the doors across the federal government because they can do a lot of this stuff themselves. Congress might have to force them to do it, but they can do a lot of these changes themselves. And we're, you know, we don't really care how it happens. We're trying to make that change. Uh, and so we are going to be using stories, you know, just like yours, JJ, to try to uh, explain why these changes are needed. Um, and you have to make them all at the same time to make them all so that you can really guarantee access to clinical trials. So I appreciate the question and, and for sharing your story. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, JJ, I appreciate that question. Um, I did wanna acknowledge we're getting um, several questions about Evershell and we'll um, hold those to the end, um, Brian, but I just wanted to let you know those were coming in um, and we can talk about them um, maybe after our next um, priority highlights. Um, and I did want to also address, there was a question that talked about, or that asked how to get access to clinical trials when needed. Um, and I wanted to be sure to point out, and I know someone did write it in the chat, but for those of you who did not see it, um, at LLS, we do have a clinical trials um, 
Navigation Center. And I would highly encourage anyone who is considering a trial or is looking into the possibility of one to be in to be in contact with them through our Information Resource Center because it's um, a great service that we provide at LLS to um, our patients and families. Um, and so I wanted to make sure to say that out loud. Um, and there was another question here. Um, Brian, I don't know that you have the answer to this, but um, I'll put it out there. Um, as CML, CML patients have been dealing with daily side effects of their oral cancer treatments for over um, many, many years. Um, and these um, drugs are expensive, but what is being done to find a true cure for CML? Um, again, not sure if you have that, have that answer um, in your back pocket, but figured I'd um, say it out loud. I mean, it's an important thing to raise because it's similar to pediatrics where, you know, we have treatments that work for a lot of people, you know, CML similarly, we have treatments that work for a lot of people, but for one, it doesn't work for everyone. Um, and for, and secondly, if it works against your cancer, there are so many side effects. So we can't stop research when we have a successful treatment that still has uh, so many side effects. Um, so you know, I think that is an all LS activity of, you know, investing in that research and within our research department, uh, partnering with folks to make that happen and then continuing to push the federal government to invest in the type of research, um, not just in the types of diseases that result in the most deaths, uh, but the type of diseases that still have unmet medical needs um, is so critical. Great. Thanks so much, Brian. Um, and I'll just say before I turn it over to Lucy to um, tackle our next um, our next topic area, there was a question from Julia um, about action steps. Um, Julia, you are um, speaking my language um, as an advocacy professional. That is what we are all about, how to take action and what, are, what do we need to do about it. Um, so rest assured at the very end of the program, we'll be talking about what is happening next. We'll be talking about our virtual day of action and how everyone can get involved. But um, again, just keeping us on track, I'm gonna turn it over to Lucy to um, talk about our next area. Thanks, Danielle. Um, so, our, so for our third and final topic today, um, we're going to talk about our efforts really to improve access to high quality, easy to use healthcare coverage. Um, but before I dive in, we're gonna hear from Michael, an advocacy uh, ambassador from Pennsylvania. My name is Michael Riato. I'm here today as a 10 year multiple myeloma survivor to talk about the No Surprises Act and CAPS or Consumer Assistance Programs. I was a victim myself uh, several times over the past few years of surprise medical bills. I broke my, my left foot um, a few years ago and I went to see my normal orthopedic who was in my network. However, the doctor I saw as I found out months later when the EOBs came that the doctor was out of network. And because the doctor was out of network, the boot that he fitted me with was also out of network. The bill was like $1,100. It takes an enormous amount of time on my effort and many consumers' efforts to get something like that fixed and corrected. I couldn't tell you how many times I spent on the phone calling the insurance company, calling the provider to try to get that adjusted. You know, I consider myself a fairly smart guy you know, but when you look at the explanation of benefits and you look at your hospital billing and you try to match it all up, sometimes it's just completely overwhelming. It takes an exorbitant amount of time. And you know, you don't need to, to, to fight an insurance company or a provider for a bill that, that rightly shouldn't be, be charged to you. You know, you're, you're trying to correct your, and trying to help your illness and you wanna fight your illness, not necessarily the insurance company. So it's something we need to change. Will you help? Thanks, thanks so much, Michael, for sharing sharing your story. And um, hi, everyone. I'm really thrilled to be able to join you today. As as Danielle said, I'm Lucy Culp. I'm Brian's counterpart. I head up our state government affairs team at LLS. So you know, when it comes to health insurance, <laughs> there's really one thing I think we can almost all agree on: it's complicated, right? From choosing the plan that's best for you and your family to navigating what the plan will cover, how much they'll cover, and what steps are necessary before they'll cover it, right? It's all challenging and, and complex. Um, in fact, as Mary Elena mentioned, in a recent poll um, commissioned by LLS, we found that a vast majority of people think that coverage is unaffordable, 
that the shopping process is frustrating, it's confusing, it's overwhelming. And even after you do your research, it's just too difficult to understand what the plan will actually cover. To make matters worse, right? Patients who receive a blood cancer diagnosis face a really complex journey as they navigate their treatment options. Um, it's especially complicated for patients who need access to doctors or hospitals that are outside of their insurance company's network. Um, meaning that, you know, while someone is navigating a treatment pathway, they're also navigating this complex process of exceptions and appeals um, and, and through their company and, and all of the nuances of their plan. Um, so a number of the priorities that Mary Elena mentioned at the top of the call um, are, you know, are really aimed at solving just these problems. You know, we're working to ensure that all insurance products play by the same rules so that no matter what the diagnosis, coverage is there when, you, when it's needed. We're also working to ensure that plans are easier to use. Um, you know, by, by advocating for more robust networks, but also, you know, making sure that the process to receive out-of-network care is simpler and easier to navigate for patients and their families. Um, and we're working to ensure that patients no longer receive surprise bills. That's the over 10 million bills, like the ones that Michael got, that get sent out each year for out-of-network care that, you know, oftentimes through no fault or without a patient even knowing that they were coming or that they were receiving care outside of network. And lastly, we're advocating for the return of consumer assistance programs in every state. So consumer assistance programs are also known as CAPS, have a track record of success, yet they've been left to really languish without funds to support them in recent years. Um, CAPS can be that neutral party that is ready and able to help a patient or their family navigate the jargon, the layers of bureaucracy, the rounds of appeals to get the patient the care that they need. So we have, we have champions for these programs on Capitol Hill. They're asking for dedicated funding this year. They need advocates like us you know, to really make this funding a priority in congressional offices so that um, Congress funds consumer assistance programs when it comes time to fund the government. You know, with that, I'll, I'll pause um, here and see if we have questions, Danielle. Thanks, Lucy. Um, this, uh, this topic in particular is um, really interesting to me, especially working so closely with patients and families on a daily basis. Um, I'm going to, is there anyone in the audience that might have a question they'd like to ask live as I'm scanning the question, the Q&A function and also the chat function? Oh, Scott, I see your, I see your, I see your hand raised. Hi, Lucy. Hi, Danielle. Um, it's Scott Sachs from, uh, from Illinois. Uh, I am a long-term advocate with LLS and uh, I, I know we've got plenty of other folks like me on the call today as well. And for the longest time, we've been hearing uh, from LLS and others about these, these junk plans. And we've all called and written to Congress about the dangers of these short-term plans that, that certainly discriminate, particularly against patients uh, with pre-existing conditions. Here in Illinois, we have advocated to limit short-term plans from being sold in the state. But so how would a consumer assistance program help the return of one, right? Because we had one in the past, right? So how would the return of that really help patients navigate against this type of health coverage and, and protect them from issues like what Michael has seen and everybody else is seeing? Yeah, Scott, thanks for that question. You're, you're, you're speaking my language here, right? Because it's all really connected. I mean, what we've seen kind of um, over the last number of years is as these kind of junkier substandard products have really proliferated in the market and gotten more and more common that, that along with those really inappropriate marketing or inaccurate marketing um, and, you know, folks will kind of do their due diligence, talk to, you know, someone they think is a is a reputable broker or agent, but gets steered towards a plan that really doesn't provide the coverage that they need. And that's where, you know, when, when we have caps that are fully funded and stood up in every state, you have this, this unbiased resource available to you as a consumer, someone you can call and say, okay, give me the brass tacks to help me understand what's this plan versus this plan, you know, based on my needs, what's going to work the best for me. Um, and, you know, they're not, they're not swayed by commissions or other types of, um, uh, you know, things that might draw them to one plan or another, right? They're truly kind of an impartial, unbiased resource for, for support. So thanks I, guess, 
Uh, and thanks. I, I, that's just a quick follow up to that, uh, I suppose. So it's great if we can get that across all 50 states, right? And, and so consumers have access to that unbiased opinion who's not swayed by, you know, money. That's terrific for choosing the plan. What happens to those who've already made the choice? Like, would a, would a cap help yeah. them after the fact? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, they can help too with the, um, you know, the appeals process. Um, you know, say you need to access, you know, a second opinion outside of your network um, and your insurance company says, nope, we only cover a network for these types of opinions. You can go to, uh, you know, call the consumer assistance program and they can help you navigate that appeals process um, to, to make sure, you know, because it's complicated, right? It's there it is. a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of pieces mm -hmm. that involves the insurance commissioner. Sometimes it involves, you know, pulling your doctor in to help explain why that out of network care is so important. Um, so having that kind of ally who's an expert in, in navigating this is going to, is, is really going to help people. So important. Th thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks Scott. Thanks, Scott. That was a, those are really great questions. Um, I just want to point out to folks, if you go to the Q&A function um, and go under the answered section, I know that Brian was answering some questions about Medicare Part D and oral parity. And so if you're interested in those particular topics, um, you might find those answers um, helpful to you because we um, won't have time to cover all of those topics on today's call. We just have a few minutes left. Um, any other questions specifically having to do with consumer assistance programs? I know Lisa you talked about junk insurance and really just making sure that patients have, um, have what they need to have the coverage that they need to access the, access the, uh, the best care. Um, don't see any specific questions. My, my chat is a little delayed here. Um, are there any, Lucy, this might be one you uh, might be able to answer. Are there any resources available right now um, for patients who are caught up right now, like in, I, I'm, I'm guessing this question is like, right, right now in the middle of surprise medical bills, coding issues, um, where would you direct people in those particular circumstances in the here and now? Yeah, that's a great question. So some states have programs and well, every state has something. The mm -hmm. robustness and the quality of that program is gonna vary by state. But I will say, you know, call us. Call LLS. We're we're happy to help. And you know, if we if we can't help directly, we can try to get you to the right folks within your state, um, insurance company, insurance department, or or other regulators who might be able to help. So yeah, there's definitely things in place. I would say it's 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 just a little more of a mixed bag than it used to be when caps were funded in all fifty states. Perfect. Thanks so much, Lucy. And if we didn't get to your question, I'd encourage you to keep typing away over the next four minutes, because we will get back to you if you put something into the chat or the Q&A function. Um, I commit to making sure that someone on the team gets back to you with an answer. Um, but I did promise answers to two questions before the end of today's call. Um, Brian, I'm going to turn to you and just um, ask if you wanted to talk for just a few minutes um, at the end of today's call on LLS's um, work on Evershield. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, we are hard at work on Evisheld. Um, just for folks who haven't been following along, you know, Evisheld is a monoclonal antibody treatment that is really, you know, according to all the data, effective as a way to uh, really prophylaxis pr um, protection for patients um, in combination with the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, so it, with a course of vaccine plus the addition of the monoclonal antibody treatment, uh, and better, better protects people, um, specifically you know, certain people, subtypes of, of blood cancers, uh, and an active treatment for blood cancers who have compromised immune systems. It, it is much better protection for them than the vaccines alone. So we want to make sure that every patient who wants access to one of these um, antibody treatments has that ability. So the pair with the vaccine is able to protect them better from, from COVID-19. Um, we actually sent last week a letter to the White House uh, demanding that they um, 
that they secure more treatments because they are buying these treatments and then providing them to people. They have vastly under purchased for the amount of demand that there is out there. And so we want to make sure that they're actually purchasing more of these products, but not just purchasing because that alone won't solve the problem. It's also making sure that they have a plan for distribution that is equitable, that makes sense, that is uh, transparent, so that we're able to partner with, with them to make sure that that actually works for people and that, that you know, the whole shots in arms idea that actually gets to patients so that they're able to, to take the dose and, and to be able to benefit from, uh, from those treatments. That is one piece of it, making sure that people have access. Another part is uh, really an integral part of this is making sure that the CDC, FDA uh, are appropriately labeling who is immunocompromised, therefore who is able to have access to Evusheld and similar treatments. Uh, and make and you know we have a lot of data at LS about the types of uh, immune compromised uh, situations for various people uh, in and out of treatment with different subtypes. And so we're working to make sure that we are you know, communicating to those agencies so that they have clearer guidance for providers. I think folks mentioned even in the Q and A in the chat that you know some have had success at their provider of getting uh, mm -hmm. Evusheld, some have not um, because the rules are really hard to understand. They're being interpreted differently. And we want to make sure it's clear that really all blood cancer patients will be able to have that access if they, um, they and the doctor agree that it's going to be helpful for them. Perfect. Thanks so much, Brian. I, I appreciate you addressing that question. Um, and again, if we didn't get to your question today, um, I promise that we someone from the team will get back to you um, if it's in the chat or in the Q&A function. But I did say that I wouldn't end today's call without giving you next steps, action items, because um, that's what I do. Um, we are having our virtual day of action on March 16th. And to register, it is really simple. You can text LLS action to 69866 and you will be registered. Um, and this is our one day during the year where the entire LLS community comes together with one collective voice to tell Congress, um, it, to talk to Congress about issues that are really critical for blood cancer patients, like the ones that you heard Brian and Lucy and Mary Elena talk about today. Um, we're really looking forward to our virtual day of action this March um, in just four weeks. So I would encourage you to register and sign up. Um, and beyond, beyond our virtual day of action, right, this is just one day, all throughout the year, um, we will let you know when your voice can make a difference, when sending that email, writing that, um, writing that email, making that phone call, posting on social media, um, when that particular action will make the biggest difference. Um, and we would encourage you to join us in all of those ways. Um, there are also lots of op other opportunities to get involved um, at the state level. And if you reach out to us, we will be sure to connect you um, with the right team member. Um, but we are always looking for advocates who are willing to stand up um, next to us and raise their voices because again, we couldn't do this work without you. So thank you. Thank you for your time today. Um, and um, we look forward to seeing you at a virtual day of action. Have a nice day.